It's a lot of fun. The, yes. the yes, one we is. saw today is a, is a beautiful property. In the summer, it will look like tropical paradise. Sandy Beach on Lake Erie, just amazing. <laughs> the only price, the only problem is it's not a million dollar view, it's a two million dollar view. And uh, well, yeah, yeah, those are the prices right now. Yeah, very silly, actually, very, very silly. But hey, whatever everybody wants to do, it's their business, not mine, right? right. But anyways, we have three quarters of an hour. So if we can do something for half an hour, and then if we have questions, Vladimir, we'd be open right. to questions. Of course. Of course. Okay. So well, yeah, so welcome everyone. We're going to be talking about if it is the right way to go. Instead of asking someone to sign a one-year lease, could we be doing a month to month? What are the pros and cons of doing that? And Vladimir is going to explain that. And I think we'll just start off, Vladimir, with the month to month, what it is right. exactly. Well, this is really a pros and cons conversation. It's not really one way better than the other. Um, so I, I don't advocate for one way over the other. It really depends on, on your situation as a landlord and what are your long-term and short-term goals. Mm -hmm. um, I can explain that um, with the short-term, of course, uh, the, the downside is you, you, you have a tenant that can move out anytime. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not such a good thing. Uh, times have been different. Uh, for uh, landlords. Um, market has not always been tight. Um, market has been such that you sometimes would prefer, you know, throughout history, um, most of the times as a landlord, you would prefer a long-term tenant. Yes. You would prefer to do nothing but take the check to the bank every mm -hmm. month um, or cash or, you know, just look up your iPhone and see the transfer went through. Uh, under normal circumstances, that how you would manage your, uh, you know, your rental business, uh, especially if you have multiple properties. If you have a short-term tenant, obviously, um, you are um, on their schedule. Whenever they free, they want to move, they're free to move. As soon as the market turns um, in in favor of the tenants, they're going to be shopping around, and you're going to be, you know, losing tenants and having a lot of vacancies. Mm -hmm. That's that's self-evident that's obvious that's clearly the downside of it now let's talk about uh what could be uh your potential benefit if you have a a, a tenant on a month to months or uh, there's also a weekly tenancy which, which doesn't make it a short term we, we can touch on that um we can touch on, on on that separately but just to be clear just because you have a weekly tenancy and a tenant pays you weekly that doesn't mean it's a short-term tenant neither if a tenant pays you monthly means it's a it's a not a short-term tenant that, that's governed by a completely different set of rules but uh for this so so i just want to make sure we're using a we're using um uh, the the correct uh, vocabulary which is not short-term versus long-term but we are talking about fixed term versus monthly Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. what we're talking about. And I'll just just I'll just interject right now, Vladimir. Yeah. Um, I prefer to have someone come and try the place out. I mean, I mean, like I've been uh, I've been doing this for twenty years, okay, and yeah. it's always, it's worked in my favor in many respects. So for me, I've had people saying, "Do you mind if we try it out for four months?" I said, "Sure." And you know what, Vladimir, a lot of times is they've turned out to stay four years, which is what's been happening too, right? So what it is, is they feel uncomfortable. They don't really know if that's the place for them. But the, the secret is make it very enticing and, uh, you know, be your best. I mean, be your best because if these are good tenants, you want them to stay longer. So it's worked in my favor to do it that way, but it's not for everyone else, right? It's not for everyone else, but I have preferred it because I don't want to be stuck with somebody who's not going to end up paying and we don't like each other. It's better that they go and I wait for the next person. But I've been able to do that because I have money in the bank and it's been able to carry me. But it's this is not the strategy for everyone. OK, so yeah. go right ahead. Well, well you, you have to be careful because just because you um, you have a, 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 a monthly tenancy as opposed to a fixed uh, tenancy. That, that doesn't mean that uh, you are also free to end the tenancy anytime mm -hmm. you want, right? 
as a matter of fact, you can never, almost never end the tenancy just because the, the contract is up. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just because you have a, a, a monthly tenancy or a weekly tenancy, or in fact, in any case, a landlord is has a harder time ever terminating a tenancy than a tenant does, all right? So what does, if any, what does, what kind of benefit does it give you uh, a monthly or, or, or not, in, not being in a fixed tenancy? Well, um, you do have the opportunity from, you know, when the circumstances arise to take the uh, apartment or to take a unit in your, your, in your own use or to ask the tenant to leave so you can renovate it or you can potentially demolish and do something else with the property. And uh, you can only do that when uh, the lease is up or at the end of the rental period. The rental period being, uh, if in, in case of a monthly tenancy, being at the end of the months, which is, uh, you know, how, how the rent is being paid. So if your rental period is from the 1st to the 30th or 31st, and that's the end of the rental period, if your rent is from the 15th to the 14th or from the 20th to the 19th, and that's the end of the rental period. And uh, you, can, um, you can require your tenant to vacate um, if you have a lawful reason to make that um, uh, requirement, and then you can immediately apply to the board for eviction. Now, if you um, thought you were lucky getting this wonderful two-year lease uh, from this wonderful tenant, and then um, uh, within the currency of that lease, you, you know, you happen to need a place for yourself, then you're no longer lucky because now in order to in order to require the tenant to leave, you have to wait until the end of their two-year tenancy, and only then you can uh, you can give them a notice um, for uh, for your own use, uh, which is known as uh, Form N12, and only then you can potentially evict them. Uh, same with renovations. Same with demolition. The only problem, the only difference with demolition is if you're required by the um, government authority, if say if your if your unit is not in compliance with municipal codes, or if the you know municipality requires you to uh, to demolish it and stop renting because it's against the zoning, then of course you can uh, you can evict the tenant. But uh, apart from that, if you're just trying to renovate um, in the tenant circle, also known as renovations, if you're trying to acquire it for your own use, then you have to wait until the end of the year, as opposed to on a monthly or weekly tenancy you can do it on a 60 days or a 90 days notice and um, mm -hmm. depending on the type of application. Now, another uh, type of application where uh, this can become uh, very relevant is what if your tenant is consistently late on payment? Uh, if they are simply uh, not respecting the term of, um, you know, the their rental agreement and, um, you, you you see the you know government certain government officials come out on uh, uh, on on all kinds of media uh, all the time, literally uh, in, in, in in inciting a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. uh, so, you know, telling the tenants that if you don't have, you know, you you you, you don't have to pay rent yes. essentially, right? Um, <laughs> If that happens to you, what, are, what is your recourse? Mm -hmm. um, a, a form you can serve uh, or, or a notice that you can serve to terminate tenancy for things like that non-payment of consistent non-payment of rent is a form that can only be served at the end of the tenancy. So um, if you are stuck with a two month, two year lease, that means you can't serve that form. And uh, you're not sleeping well. You are thinking, "Am I going to get paid that? You know, next month? Maybe otherwise your tenant is good, but they're just they're just late. They always late. They always pay on the fifteenth, and you always live under this constant stress mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and threat of you know, what if I'm not going to get paid? And uh, you know, so 
all of these things um, uh, come into play um, when you decide if you want to go on a monthly tenancy or or a, a fixed term tenancy. Now, if you're renting yourself, if you're strong, if you have money to um, to weather the storm, if if financially um, you can you can handle a little upset every once in a while, then you keep the property vacant until you find your perfect tenant. Yes. That doesn't happen with most people though. Most, uh, most, especially most small tenants, oh, sorry, small landlords, they make, you know, baby steps in, in investment world. They, they come into the investment uh, with their last money, you know, of, couple of hundred thousand dollars that they've saved up or you know they moved from one house to another they they um, they were able to uh, collect some equity from one move to the next move and now they, they maybe get a line of credit hoping to invest and you know dreaming of a better future then they buy themselves an apartment and they you know become a landlord and uh, things don't work out for them uh, usually you know they uh, they get help from the same real estate agent who sold them the property in the first place. That same real estate agent um, helps them rent the place. Uh, real estate agent, real estate agents, a great resource. I'm a real estate agent and I, you know, I, I, I can't speak badly about my profession, but you have to understand the, 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 uh, the absurdity of the fact that real estate agents have license to, arrange residential leases, but they have no legal training in how to make these contracts or how to negotiate these contracts. So even how to, um, e even the legality of some of the things that they attempt to put into these contracts. Um, and uh, conversely, paralegals, which I'm also one, uh, have the legal training that, you know, we can we can help people make contracts, but we can't because our license is restricted this way. So uh, we can litigate a realist, uh, uh, we can litigate a, a rental agreement, but we can't help you make one. So there's a little bit of a, um, a, of a difficulty that a landlord, especially a small uh, landlord who is just going through the learning curve um, has to go through to get their property rented. So, um, this is why it's so important for uh, for the for you to educate yourself and, and go through all the materials, go through take up take your time and attend all the webinars that you can possibly attend and read all the books that you can possibly read. Study the land, the Residential Tenancies Act, uh, study the board procedures, read articles, talk amongst yourself, participate in the groups, and educate yourself because there is no single professional that can save you at the end of the day. Except yourself. And Except you and I both agree that it, it really depends upon you um, choosing the right tenant to begin with. I mean, that's, that's why I keep preaching like an idiot that if you don't choose the right person to begin with, you're gonna have trouble. Just choose the right person. Just that is absolutely key. Once, yeah. once, once things go wrong, yeah. it's, it's very, very hard. I know. I know that is the problem. That is the problem. And I know that a lot of people who are here, a lot of a number of you are in my mastermind and we all agree. That's what, you know, and that's the things that you want to know more about is how do I choose the right tenant? How, how am I not going to be fooled by people? And, and, you know, it takes time to understand that. But remember, you have an investment of half a million dollars at times. Are you, you know, if you were to buy a Lamborghini, would you throw a set of keys at them and say, ah, oh, just go ahead and drive it? So why would you give the keys to anyone that doesn't fulfill your obligations that they need to fulfill for you, for you to feel comfortable and sleep at night. This is what we need to do is sleep at night and not have to worry someone's going to start, um, you know, start bringing prostitutes to the home or start a grow up or all kinds of things, you know, it's all kinds of things. And Gail said something, you know, I love this Gail and you're, you know, you're so wise. I just love you, Gail. Gail said this in the chat, she said, if an employer hired the wrong person, they can fire them. If you are a business too, we should be able to fire our tenants by not renewing their leases. 
I agree. I agree a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. Well, it's it, 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 there's some truth to that. There should certainly be more tools for the landlords to be able to protect yes. uh, their investment. At the same time, we we do understand that it it, it is your house it is your property but it's somebody else's home right mm -hmm. they make a home there and it's it's sacred it's yeah. it's private it's it's you know they they have a right to uh, to privacy and quiet enjoyment and and you can't just kick somebody out of a home no. especially mm -hmm. especially you know with when there's human rights issues at play when it's it's someone who is who is uh, under a disability or maybe not having difficult time finding another place for whatever reason uh, it could be i mean it could be very inhumane you know to for the landlord to be able to come in and just you know take it back on a whim so yes the laws uh, exist to protect the tenants but the laws are also in my opinion very skewed uh to not protect the landlords when the tenants go bad and there's enough tenants that abuse those laws. And just like the laws exist in order to protect the tenants from landlords abuse, which happens, we need to acknowledge that it's, it, it's there. Yes. And, um, and, and these laws as a society, we need to have those laws in place to protect tenants from abuse. Mm -hmm. We also need laws to protect landlords from abuse by, by the tenants. By, you know, and, and certainly my members are not concerned about the normal tenants, but it's, the castle is not their home if what they're doing is beating up the house and, and not paying and destroying a property. Oh. I mean, that is, is unlawful. It's criminal. They should be thrown in jail for that. We, should yeah, be we, keep hearing, we keep hearing horror stories about small landlords, um, you know, moms and pops operation of people in their, you know, 50s and 60s who just, we just hope that this, you know, one rental property is their way to retirement. Yes. Um, they're nurturing this property, they're investing into it, they're just, you know, that's their retirement plan, essentially. And then it's being trashed, it's, you know, they, they default on their mortgage as a result, they lose that retirement plan, there has to be protection for that, yes. but there isn't. So the protection is uh, up to you, up to each individual yes. landlord. Yes. And your only protection, essentially, in these circumstances, I mean, you can, uh, you can say what you want about the government, until we elect uh, people that are uh, willing to hear our side as landlords. Uh, it's not going to change. But until then, um, your only uh, protection is uh, to take care of yourself, to, you know, to, to, to select, select your tenant very carefully. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it's the tenant's fault, it's the government's fault, it's everybody else's fault, but it's you who are suffering. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. There are things you can do differently. There are. So do them differently. Yeah. Right? And then there's no pointing fingers. No. Can we ask if there's any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'm going to see if I can unmute. Does anyone, just, just go in the chat and let me know if you want to ask uh, Vladimir a question. Just go in the chat. I think Gail probably will have a question. Uh, probably Renata will have a question. Gail? Gail, anyone have a question? Uh, no, I don't have a question yet. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify like my previous comment. I'm not talking about kicking tenants out on a whim. I mean, no, of course not. It, landlords are in the business. Yes. to have tenants. I mean, we're not in the business to evict our tenants. We want to make money and, and uh, we want our tenants to be happy. So uh, I'm just saying about leases, right? Because, you know, they go on forever. Yeah. And if a tenant yeah. is damaging your place or non-payment or rent and this is going on and on and on and you're just tired of it, yes. should have an option to be able to re renew their lease or not. I mean, they well, theoretically, that's the option you have with, a, uh, with the instrument called Form N5. Um, it, in practice, it, it takes a, 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 a very, you know, strong effort, you know, takes a lot of cost and, and effort and time in order to make that effective and make good on that, uh, on that instrument. Yeah, and I've, I've been a landlord for 20 years and I have, I have never evicted a tenant. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. So I'm not in the business of evicting anybody, but you hear these horror stories, all this damage and unpaid rent and everything. It's like, do you know, I mean, 99% of all these problems would be uh, solved if we could just not renew people's leases. I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. And Ashwin, 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 un unmute yourself, Ashwin. Okay. Hi. Hi, Ashwin. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So we can ask you a question, Ashwin. Oh, I didn't have a question, but oh, no. I see yeah. I see a comment from you it says, "Do you see in the future a landlord will be able to terminate the lease with a oh. reasonable time frame?" Yeah. Um, oh no, that that was a question that I'd asked in another session, but oh, it came up here. <laughs> that, that was me. That was oh, another God. Ashwin. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm so okay. Yeah. Go ahead. You want us to answer that? Yeah, see, like like it is reasonable if a small landlord wants to sell their property, they should not be held hostage. Usually, you know, when you want to sell your property a year in advance or six months in advance. So do you see uh, the, rules, the laws changing uh, right. to make this possible? Right. Th this would be nice. Unfortunately, it's not trending that way. Um, in in uh, Even with... Uh, a conservative government, uh, you know, provincial government, we still, we still see a trend towards uh, uh, more protection for the tenant, less protection for the landlord, which is unfortunate and surprising. Um, everyone expected when Ford government came in, everyone expected them to roll back um, some of the uh, last changes that um, the previous liberal government made in 2017. Mm -hmm. Uh, even I remember Harry Fine was very surprised by the fact that some of those changes that were so outrageous, they were not rolled back. Mm -hmm. So um, this is not where it's trending. It, it, it totally makes sense what you're saying. There should be some mechanism for people to be able to take back their property, but but there isn't. And it doesn't seem likely that it, it, it will in the near future. Uh, instead, uh, the rules are tightening. They they now introduced um, a, a payout under N12. Even if you're taking it for your own use, now you have now you owe um, tenant um, a compensation. Even if even if a buyer uh, coming in like that, that's the new thing that they just introduced in 2020. It used to be that a buyer did not have to pay that compensation. Well, not the buyer, but the landlord. But when when a, when a purchaser uh, requires the property for their own use, that compensation wasn't payable, and now it is. So, it, 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 again, it's trending towards uh, protecting people's uh, home and uh, uh, and and their their uh, property, a, a home that they rent for themselves. It's not trending towards more protection for the landlord. So, you have to adapt mm -hmm. by again coming back to the same thing again. So very uh, uh, st strict selection, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, if you come to a, a time when uh, you know you need to sell your investment property, um, Maria and I uh, ran a show maybe a couple of months ago on how to sell a tenanted property. You may want to search that video mm -hmm. where um, I I was invited to speak on you know all the things and all the tools you can use and um, how to. You know, what, what are your different options when you're selling a tenanted property? One of the things we, uh, we came to, uh, to, con to conclusion was about uh, best way of doing it is by uh, removing the tenant uh, prior yeah. to making that, you know, putting the property on the market. And um, uh, you do this by way of uh, reaching an agreement with your tenant. You, you, there's no way you, you can't kick them out. You have to find an agreement, and some you know some ten tenants can be reasonable, others may not be reasonable. So it's really it's really a risk that we all take uh, when we go into this investment. Mm -hmm. And Ashwin, uh, I, I did many fix and flips, and what happened was that when I um, when I had the house and the tenants left is that's when I went in there fixed it up and just sold it. So I've only sold my properties that are empty. I've never sold it with tenants in it. 
just like I've only bought once in 20 years a house that had tenants in it already <clears throat> and it worked out fine, there wasn't a problem. <clears throat> but, you know, rule of thumb, you should know way ahead what your plans are. You know, like maybe what you should do is just purchase a property and do a fix and flip with it rather than get tenants in there, they're going to bother you. And maybe another way of doing it is if you have more than one property, you know, um, refinance one of the properties that can carry the house and sell it. Like there's many ways of doing it. You don't have to necessarily wait until the tenant leaves. Just don't just only don't, don't get a tenant to begin with. You've got to you've got to learn to play by their rules and outsmart the government, outsmart everybody, outsmart the government, outsmart the tenant. You have to be this is your game. You've got to learn how to do it. OK, Ashwin. But thank you very much, Vladimir. And I, I can see here Renata has a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Renata. So Vladimir, still, if you say there is a short term, so a designated time frame set for, um, doesn't matter if it's three weeks or two months, if it's a set time frame for a vacation or a student who has a co-op or a worker from out of town, are you still stuck to the Ontario lease? Okay, um, that's an excellent question. I think uh, Maria had another session with um, Harry Fine that covered that really, really well. And I can just repeat, um, in, in, you know, from, uh, from what was already covered, uh, that uh, there is a section in the Residential Tenancies Act that specifically uh, deals with um, uh, types of uh, uh, accommodations that are excluded from the application of Residential Tenancies Act. One of the things that Harry mentioned was, um, uh, I'm very fond of Harry. He's, he's, oh, he's, he's, such, a, he's such a wealth of knowledge. Yes, um, one of the things that he mentioned is when you, look at, uh, when you look at the act and it says, if the accommodation is provided for vacation in your traveling uh, public, that's not the same as the tenant. An Airbnb provides, um, or any any kind of short-term rental, which is why we made a distinction in the beginning. I made a distinction between short-term rental versus monthly rental, uh, long-term rental versus fixed-term rental. A short-term rental under the bylaws of your municipality may be a fixed amount of time. That means if, you're, if you are renting for less than that amount, let's say 28 days, like in, in GTA or some other parts in, uh, in Ontario, let's say uh, if you're renting for less than 28 days, then you require a license, or maybe there are some restrictions, or maybe you cannot rent for less than 28 days, period, in, in, you know, some, in, in some uh, jurisdictions. But that doesn't mean that um, 29 days uh, is when your tenant automatically becomes a tenant under the Residential Tenancies Act, and it doesn't convert to uh, Ontario lease situation automatically. If, uh, the, if the place you're renting are for the purpose of traveling or vacationing people, uh, and they need that place for two months, that is still a short-term rental. That is still a, a travel accommodation or a vacationing uh, accommodation. And uh, they are uh, still covered by the uh, Innkeepers Act or uh, other rules, but not the Residential Tenancies Act necessarily. So no, it's not, it's not an Ontario lease situation uh, automatically. It's, uh, it's all how you word uh, that agreement. So if you're taking a tenant who is, um, who is a weekly tenant or even a monthly tenant, and you know that this is not going to be uh, for them to establish their home, Maybe it's their second home because they have a business in, in, you know, in your town, but they really you know, domicile in other parts of the country or you know, in another city. That, you, you, can, you can word that into your, into your agreement with them so they do not become a tenant and a residential lease is not required in that case. Good point. Very good point. That's a really good point. I'm just going to say, uh, Gail and um, Renata and Vladimir, we're going to discuss this further in our mastermind group where uh, Vladimir can go deeper into it. But you have a really good point there, Vladimir, which I like, which uh, everyone here, just hold on to that idea because that may be the way you can get around some things, some silly things here. Mm -hmm. We only have six minutes. So does anyone else have a question that Vladimir can uh, answer or if Vladimir just wants to finish off somehow here? 
What would you like to say? Anyone have a question? Or Vladimir, did you want to say anything further? I, this is Bill. I got uh, one question. Hi, Bill. Very short. Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, what Vladimir just described, does, it, does the same thing apply on the student rentals? Because students are also their temporary, uh, temporary basis, right? Temporary. Well, I mean, any rental is 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 in theory a temporary, uh, you know, temporary accommodation. So it it, it, it then really it, it has to be um, it has to be common sense. If somebody rents a place for a year or close to a year, and and they're renting it for the purpose of um, uh, living there res as a student residence, residing there, you know, for the purpose of attending a, a school nearby, then it's their home, essentially. If they establish their home in that rental unit, then that's what it is, and Ontario lease applies. Um, if, however, let's say uh, I live in Toronto, and then I decide to go to a professional school, and I'm admitted uh, at the University of Ottawa, and um, I don't go to Ottawa all the time, but I would like to maintain an apartment in Ottawa for the period of, uh, you know, duration of maybe preparation for my exams. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, that may be two months or three months. Then I'm, I'm temporary. I, I, I maintain my house, my residence, my home in Toronto or in GTA, but then um, I need a place to stay when I, when I happen to be uh, close to my my school, it, it it really depends how you word that into your agreement. Uh, if you make a nine months rental agreement for a student or not, it, it it's most more likely to to be seen uh, as a as a residential lease. If you make a, a one month, a two months, maybe even a three months agreement, renewable, um, you know that resembles Airbnb agreement more than it, it you know, it looks like a re, uh, someone establishing a place of home, then yeah, you have a better chance of, uh, uh, of relying on that exemption. But you have to be very careful with that. It's, you know, uh, a tenant can, can protest that exemption and uh, challenge that uh, in the landlord and tenant board and it will be up to the adjudicator really. So. Um, once you have again, to make sure that it makes sense. You know what? Once again, choose the right person. Check them out. Go to their home. Check their employment. You know, look at their car. Do everything you need to do to find out if that's truly the person you want in your home, whether long-term or short-term rental. Bill and everyone else here. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Bill, Luca, Shrewd, D, D, Adrian, Vivian Stark, Renata, Gail. Haram, JG, Ken Mitchell, glad to have you join us, Ashwin, and the others that have come and gone, maybe they had a hard time getting back in, I don't know. But I want to thank you very much, Vladimir. We're going to have to do um, a be live session, you and I, where we can go into more detail without having someone come on with their bodily parts. <laughs> I apologize. We may not, I may not be able to even put this on YouTube because of that. I'm sorry to say, uh, I you, can, you can cut it. You can cut it. You can edit it out. If I know how to do that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, everyone, I'm probably going to have Vladimir uh, give us another session, probably privately on uh, my B Live station. Then I can just, you know, have everyone join. You know, watch it at that time. But I do want to thank everyone for being here. Anybody have a last minute anything at all? We have two minutes left. Oh, here it is, Renata. Would a furnished unit have more chances to go a short term? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what Absolutely. I do, Renata. Yeah, but yeah, well, then again, the, uh, it all comes down to how you create the agreement. Does it become the, yes. the person's home? There are plenty of furnished units mm -hmm. um, that are meant for, for long-term fixed-term tenancies. Um, just because it's, a, it's, it's furnished doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically excluded, but furnished units are more likely to serve as short-term accommodations yes. and short-term can mean two months, three months, even, even six months, as long as it's not for the purpose of, you know, to establish that person's home. That is key. Uh, go to the Residential Tenancies Act. The definitions are there. 
Um, Harry pointed out them you know, very clearly, very concisely in another webinar with Maria. So uh, watch that webinar again. It's, it's excellent. Excellent information. Yes, and you'll find it on my YouTube channel, Real Estate Media News Network. So I'm going to say I, goodbye to everyone. And Vladimir, yeah. thank you for being on my webinar. And we will see you in our private mastermind group where Gail and yeah. Renata can ask all the questions. Okay. Thanks Pleasure very much. As always. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. See you next Monday. Bye bye.